so today's talk uh, is going to be a two-part talk. The first part, I'll give you some sense of the kind of applications uh, which require us to deal with very large amounts of data, serious amounts of uh, number crunching. Okay, and the second part. I'll go into a little more detail on one of the cloud computing data management systems we've been building. Uh, uh, the peanut system. Okay. Without further ado, oh, one, one last thing I should say. Uh, many, many of the slides here are stolen. Okay. In particular, if you see nice PowerPoint actions, they're all stolen. Uh, let's get going. I already told you this part. Let's keep going. So Yahoo has lots of data, lots of users and the sun never sets on the Yahoo empire. Okay, that's that slide. So, why is Yahoo doing cloud, cloud computing? Unlike Amazon, we don't offer our cloud services to external people, right? But the goal is internally, uh, whereas today Yahoo is a collection of software stacks for properties, we'd like to instead converge on a uniform fabric, right? Where much of the underlying compute elasticity is provided by the cloud, and where the properties can focus basically on their business logic, on making the properties be more uh, appealing, more functional, uh, and leave most of the common uh, infrastructure layers to be managed uniformly. Okay? Let me give you an example. So if you take the front page of Yahoo, which depending on the day of the week is visited page on the web, on the top right-hand corner, you see top searches, right? The slide is a little out of date, so the form factor may be a little bit different, but you'll see all these elements on today's front page. The index behind those searches is built using Hadoop. If you look at every ad that's shown, the choice of which ad depends upon models being built using, again, Hadoop. Hadoop. Uh, if you look at the front, this this area is called the Today Module. What you see there is a carousel of four different articles with the article in the first slot also showcased. Okay? The whole combination, the whole carousel, it's called the Today Module. I'll say more about that in a bit. Uh, when I came to Yahoo, this was completely manually programmed. Today, uh, there's an editorially curated pool of candidate articles, but what you actually see is algorithmic determined. Okay? And the algorithm that does this is called Coke uh, for content optimization. I forget what the K and the E stand for. Uh, the people who work on it, of course, are known as Coke heads. Uh, and content optimization, again, uses both Hadoop and Peanuts. Image, video, or multimedia is delivered using a cloud system called Store. Uh, something that people here actually uh, engage with us on, mail and mail spam. Uh, if you look at how we deal with mail spam, we use machine learning filters that are built using Hadoop. Uh, and we are also uh, using Mob Store to deliver the attachments in your mail. And soon we'll be using Peanuts as well. Right. So if you look at the Today module, this is what I just uh, mentioned to you a moment ago. Let's look at this in just a little bit more detail. Right. I told you we're doing this algorithmically, and as you might expect, it's really a matchmaking problem. There's a collection of articles, the content, with sidelines that say what we can and can't show in conjunction with what else, at what times of day, and so on. Editorial voice, if you will. We know quite a bit about the user, and even something about the context. Given all of this, the algorithm does its thing. right? And this has been very, very successful. Uh, since 2008, we launched it. Relative to the best human baseline, it's more than doubled the click-through rates. Uh, so much so that Carol uh, talks about this quite frequently. Technically, what's in uh, three basic pieces. There's offline modeling, in which we look at the characteristics of the underlying articles uh, and try to distill features that are predictive. Right. And so when a new article comes into the pool, every day editors are continually programming articles. Right? What does programming an article mean? A new story breaks, they, de they decide it's good enough to be shown here, and they, they craft creatives, a photo, a caption, so on and so forth, and then it's ready. Okay? Uh, when they do this, uh, a new story has a prior attached to it. 
how good do we think it's going to be? That comes from its offline modeling, from the offline modeling applied to this new story. And there are a number of methods we use this. Yes. Then there's online learning. What we have learned here is we can do much, much better by actually uh, studying the true behavior, the true popularity of an article. So if I show you an article, it's because I think it's going to do well, but you may or may not actually click. And by studying how millions of people react to a given article, we can learn the true CTR, starting with the priors. Right? But there's a trade-off here. Uh, at any given time, I want to take the very best and show it to you. But these articles have a very short time. And so the popularity decays very rapidly. And by the time an article becomes no longer that popular because everyone's read it or it's no longer timely, you need to have a replacement in the wings. So with this, I need to explore new articles that may or may not be as good. So there's an exploration. This trade-off between the exploration of possibly promising articles and exploiting the ones that you know are good, that's you know, a very key component. A third component, yes, something is known to be really good, but it's going to decay. How quickly and how efficiently can you track decay? That's the online learning. So each of these has a variety of methods. Uh, then there are additional dimensions, such as deep personalization, uh, dealing with very large, uh, scalably large uh, content pools, uh, optimizing for metrics other than click-through rates. It's really a little field that's emerging by itself now. Uh, all of this is enabled by ability to crunch lots and lots of data, right? Hadoop, Hadoop pipelines, the peanuts store, these are intrinsic to our ability to do applications like this. And I just figured I'd give you some eye candy. Thanks to doing this, at any given point in time, the editors are looking at dashboards like this. Uh, what particular article was responsible for what kind of click-through rate? There are multiple buckets going on at any given point of time. You can look at this. Uh, there's a so-called heat map. The rows are the individual articles, and the columns correspond to different segments they care about. By the way, uh, I'm really proud I know about things like chores. Do you know what a chore is? See, I didn't either. See what we can do by going to Yahoo? Chief Household Officer. <laughs> okay. uh, and most of you guys in your 40s, your social chairman. In case you didn't know. Uh, so th these are the various segments that advertisers try to target. And editors look at the articles and see which articles appeal to which category. They have advertising pools they need to deliver to certain segments. So they program more articles that appeal to a certain kind, yada, yada, yada. Uh, to be honest, if you look at that 100% CR improvement, my state of the pants guess about half of that came from purely algorithmic improvements. The other half came because of tools like this that enable humans in the loop to program better content. Okay? Uh, so I'll skip over this in the interest of time. Now let me switch over to a very, very different kind of uh, application. Uh, you all know that Microsoft and Yahoo made a deal on search. In contrast to what many people seem to think, this doesn't mean that Yahoo is not going to do so. Quite the contrary, right? The 10 blue links that you see on a page, that's the part that we will draw upon from Microsoft's APIs. But the rest of what goes on a page is what we will double down on and really work to make uh, a differentiating aspect of Yahoo's search page. So let me give you an example of this. On this page, when I search for Julia Roberts, look closely at the parts I have boxed out. Those are direct displays. What you see up here, right, there are tabs for news, for videos, Twitter feeds about, uh, tweets about Julia, things like this. On the left, you have a collection of other entities, other actors and celebrities in this case, who have some kind of connection or the other to Julia. Right. This is the part that's going to be very different on Yahoo versus Bing versus Google. Right. What's blue, what I really minimized in this screenshot, are the, uh, those are the first of the 10 blue links. Today, if you look at the three major search engines, uh, they're very, very close to each other for, the, for most queries on these 10 links. But this other part, it's all over the map. Goes the Wild West, and here's where differentiation is beginning to occur. What's really going on is concept-centric or entity-centric aggregation of information. The information shown in these boxes is public, but it's typically collated from multiple sources. Okay? 
So what I like to describe this as is a transition from a web of pages where the basic index you have goes from tokens to URLs of existing pages to a web of concepts where you know the tokens denote concepts, right? And when you say Julia Roberts, you're talking about Julia Roberts, the celebrity, versus maybe Julia Roberts, a chef. Not that I know one. Uh, down into the payoff, uh, the payload, which is all the information that you have managed to glean and determine is about this particular Julia Roberts. And that structured information, or structured metadata, is what you use to create the concept-centric aggregation you saw earlier. Let me give you some examples. Personally, I got into this area through some work I did with Anhai and others uh, at Wisconsin. So uh, we built a people search engine for a really important class of people, database researchers. Uh, this is my friend Gerhard Wakeham. Uh, on top, you're supposed to see photos of Gerhard Wakeham. We had visions of mass collaboration. You know that photo there of a book? That's not really Gerhard. So people would say, this is not Gerhard. Uh, there are issues here. Uh, if you talk to me offline, I'll tell you about it. But this just a point. On the right, you have people related to Gerhard, topics he's worked on, program committees he's served on, publications, so on and so forth. Right? The 4P version has his home phone number. Uh, all of this right, is public. The novel thing here is, as opposed to finding links to all the pages where this information appears, we have pulled it out, deduped it, determined that it belongs to Gerhard Wakeham, the academic. Uh, Gerhard is unique, but think of Michael Jordan, right? This is an untrivial task, and we have shown it to you. Uh, you can go from the sublime Julia Roberts uh, to the mundane. You want to buy a shower head? We can help you. Uh, shower heads near Santa Clara. These are stores that sell shower heads. You can even drill down into facets. Do you want to go to a store in Fremont, Mountain View, so on and so forth. They can also show some facets that we have not on here based on the data we have. Does this store sell shower heads or even service them? Now, servicing shower heads seems kind of quaint, but if you're talking about an appliance like a big uh, refrigerator, that's a relevant distinction, right? So at this point, the screen is becoming both the canvas on which I display the result of your query and the query interface through which you refine what you're asking for, right? Database people have long felt cheated that the web got away from them because we know that deep down everyone wants to ask SQL queries, okay? So now we have this deep, deep plan where we will get you to write SQL against your will through these kinds of interfaces. But before that, we need to take the web and distill it into a database, right? And to do that, we have to do large-scale information extraction. Here's another example. Uh, if you want to search for Egg Parmigiana uh, in San Diego, go ahead and do that in Yahoo, and you will get a link to restaurants that actually serve eggplant parmigiana. And this is not just based upon finding eggplant parmigiana in the title or the front page. We actually go analyze the restaurant sites, look at their menus, identify those that actually have eggplant parmigiana in their menus, create that as a metadata field, and when you actually search, we search against that field. Right? There's another example of information extraction applied to search. Okay, and then you can refine that, drill down. I think you get the point. All right. So there are two examples of applications that I or someone that I know has been involved in. And there are many more, right? So to do things like this on scale data, we need a tremendous amount of data management and data crunching uh, power. And that's the rest of the stock. So cloud is a bit more than a buzzword, only if you take some of the promised benefits seriously. The benefits that are usually promised include multi-tenancy. You have a cloud uh, system, and many, many users can be multi-tenanted onto the same underlying hardware, OK? Uh, so when is idle the other benefits from the spare resources, for example? Elasticity. You're currently paying for 10 servers. Your business booms. You want to double this in an hour. That's elasticity. The flip side of elasticity is, as a provider of cloud services, let's say business booms for me, I would like to roll in a rack, plug it in, 
and have all the data redistributed seamlessly, all the computation redistributed seamlessly. Okay. Of course, when you do this, you have to make sure that people are firewalled from each other. There's security because compromises of security affect a whole lot more people. Uh, metering, you need to be able to bill people for what they are renting from you. High availability is critical. And of course, operability. There's a world where you're not selling a database system to someone when you apply uh, the cloud concept to data management. You're actually undertaking to be the DBA to the world. Okay. And this means things that we as database people have been paying lip service to for a while now, right? Uh, auto tuning, uh, auto management. It is easy to pay lip service when someone else is purchasing the system from you. But when you are the DBA, and when the efficiency is dropped through to your bottom line, you take it a whole lot more seriously, okay? So today's talk, I'll touch briefly upon the things that I've highlighted, and perhaps not on the others. In the Yahoo Cloud Stack, right, there's fairly comprehensive. Uh, the idea is that every application will eventually run supplements on the Yahoo Cloud, including compute capabilities, edge caching, uh, data management, the works. In today's talk, I'll focus just on two parts. Uh, the Peanuts data serving system and the Hadoop data pipelines rose analytics uh, component. To be comprehensive though, be aware that there are at least three distinct classes of data management services. Uh, picked, oh, sometimes I say Sherpa, sometimes I say Peanuts, they are the same thing. We started writing papers calling it Peanuts. Internally, they called it Sherpa, don't ask me why. At this point, I slip into both. Uh, they are the same thing. Uh, I'll talk about Peanuts. And here, it's optimized for create, retrieve, update kind of applications. For database people, think TPCC kinds of applications. Okay. Uh, Hadoop, think OLAP or TPCH kind of applications, large scans, uh, extensive analytics. We store it as a we, we store it there as a warehouse, data pipelines, and of course, mob store, the blob storage. I will not talk about mob store at all today. I'll begin with Hadoop and speak fairly briefly for those. How many of you know about Hadoop? Okay, so pretty much everyone. I'll go through this at warp speed. There's a data file which is fragmented, which is partitioned across a collection of machines. Uh, you write a Hadoop program as a map part and a reduced part. The map part basically operates locally on each machine using just the data local to that machine. And typically, it does the grouping part, the partitioning part of a group by operation in SQL. Okay? So what does it mean? You might take all the data from click logs and partition it by user. So it's about all the actions of a given user no matter which source machine they occurred on. So your actions on the front page may go to one machine, your actions on finds may go to another machine. But after the map step, they all reside on some internal uh, machine that we can use to look at you 360 degrees. What we actually do then is the reduce part. And the result of this is also written to a bunch of machines. That in a nutshell is MapReduce. You can overlay higher level query languages like PySQL on top of this, but the common theme underneath is massively distributed computation. Okay? The number of nodes in a typical system are several thousands. In contrast to parallel databases, which typically have a few tenths. Right? Uh, a dozen nodes is a lot for, say, an, an Oracle rack system. But those nodes are typically much more powerful, and overall the system is much more efficient. But in terms of sheer brute scaling, these kinds of massively distributed systems are more cost effective for us. Okay, to continue with the primer, uh, it's great, Hadoop is great for analyzing sequentially lots and lots of data. Not That's so good for reading, writing, especially reading you know, random uh, records. Hadoop has been growing in its usage at Yahoo. Uh, the web map, the Terrasort benchmark, uh, these are examples year over year, right? You can see the running times go down, the sizes of the clusters go up, all by significant factors. Uh, largest cluster was about 2,000 nodes in 2008. It's now, I think, four or 5,000 nodes uh, with much faster use. So our usage is growing by leaps and bounds even today. An example of this, mail spam filtering. 
25 billion connections, uh, over 5 billion pieces of mail are delivered a day. Uh, Yahoo Mail is still the largest mail service. There are nearly half a billion mailboxes, right? Uh, and spam detection on this, huge, huge, huge challenge. And using Hadoop gave us, I think, about a 25-30% improvement in our ability to detect spam just over the course of the past year, right? Because here, timely turnaround turns out to be very important. As another more in-depth example, when people do pretty much thing on a property like Yahoo, we try to learn from that, right? We try to model their activity and learn from it what we can do better in targeting content or advertisements. So I'll take you through the workflow here. The number of pages we are talking about, unique pages, not page impressions, it's in the order of several millions, but end of end user sees maybe a few tenths, okay, on a given day. The number of queries, search queries, hundreds of millions, right? Uh, but any given user, just a few. The number of ads that are seen collectively, hundreds of thousands. The number seen by a given user, tens. And with this, with this backdrop, let's see how we use Hadoop. The input is multiple click streams, right? Multiple feeds uh, of the kind see here. Right? We can have web server logs, search logs, web server logs from multiple properties, right? And the output here is a single normalized feed. Uh, all events for all users over that day. And just creating this, this mapping, is a non-trivial effort. Then feature and target generation. Typically, there's some kit we are trying to predict and some conjectured features that we think will be predictive. Uh, these are all typically aggregates of some events. I'll give you more detailed examples in a moment. The kind of targets we care about, conversion rates, click-through rates, right? The things that eventually translate into revenue for us or increased engagement. So we take a window of time, right? And different actions, when aggregated, are candidate features. And certain events in a window further downstream, that's typically the target, right? And you compute this. Then you slide the window, recompute, move on, right? And the game is which combination of features together with which model is most predictive in improving your prediction, right? Where in reality, this offline data you are analyzing, but when you apply the resulting models, it's you see someone do something and you predict, you're gonna show them something new based upon your guess at what they will receive most uh, favorably. Okay, the feature generation here in Hadoop. The mapping here is typically user-based. This is the example I gave you earlier, right? Uh, so all the events for a given user are in one place. Uh, you parallelize this across many, many, many machines, and the result is uh, the feature generation. Similarly, target generation, uh, going through this fast. This supports a whole broad variety of models. Different, uh, different groups use different models for different purposes. All of these are again programmed, trained on loop. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna clip right through this. Okay, the sizes and the times involved are in order of hours for crunching through terabytes when it comes to data acquisition. If you look at something that's much more compute intensive, the model training phase, still for hundreds of gigabytes, it's in the order of hours. Right? Bottom line, even for web scale data, we are able to get through this whole pipeline on a daily cycle. We would ideally like to get this down even more, hourly, right? some ways off. Okay. I'm not gonna go into the architecture of Hadoop itself. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about the internals of a different system. So, just to do a checkpoint here, you saw some applications, you saw some of the data analysis involved in creating those applications, but what the raw data involved? So, let's say you're building a web serving application for uh, Flickr. Let's say you're trying to build a site like Flickr. What's really needed? In contrast to typical database applications, like say a banking application, we no longer are concerned about things like acid transactions. On the other hand, 
It's got to be inexpensive. It's got to be extremely scalable. Geographic replication is important to us, right? Because something that a user uploads in email may be seen by their family in India, right? And we would like this to be replicated near real time. So the game, the reason we decided to build a system from scratch, we wanted to take advantage of the things we didn't need to worry about, complex queries, asset transactions, in order to support scalability, elasticity, fault tolerance, the things we really needed. And I'll try and talk about the trade-offs we made. Right? A canonical example is user logins. Entire user logs in. <coughs> Profile information of the kind I described you know, through our user activity modeling pipeline. Right? The result of that is stored in the system. That's a key value store. And it's looked up every time a user logs in. And in turn, this profile is used to target content or ads to that user. Half a billion users, hundreds of petabytes of storage, hundreds of billions of records. There's the scale. A canonical example, if I'm trying to build something like uh, Craigslist, I may start off by trying to store key value pairs where the key is an ID for the item, for the listing. The actual item itself is just a category and a description, right? Actually, I store this in a system like uh, the one I'm about to describe. There are many other parts of the ecosystem, so just keep in mind that this is not the be all and end all. Eventually, this data is pushed to a Hadoop system for the kind of uh, analytics I talked about, and that result will eventually come back in here too. If there are images involved, so eventually I want to expand this to include a photo of the item being listed, that will be stored here with a key foreign key relationship that allows me to pull up the image. Uh, for application purposes, this is written using a messaging system. And the result of that not only goes into kernels for peanuts that are distributed geographically, it also goes into servers for keyword indexing or for caching. Okay? Time, I may decide to add additional attributes. Applications evolve. So in this example, I decide that, well, it's actually going to be nice to, have to list a price. If I do, I don't want to go back to every existing listing and force the schema to be altered, right? So you can, on the fly, add an attribute. New records can have this new attribute defined or not, okay? Uh, so at one level, this is just a parallel database system. The data is partitioned, as you would expect, horizontally partitioned for scalability. At another level, the data is also asynchronously replicated to colors that are distributed worldwide. The whole thing uh, has structured, I mean, uh, loosely structured schemas that can be uh, adapted as you go, and it's all hosted. That in the model is peanuts. Okay. There are also things like indexes, which I won't talk about, but that's let's stop there. Architecturally, there's a bank of routers, uh, routers which take a request for a record, a key, and send it to the appropriate uh, server, right? The data that's in the routers is not ground truth. It may actually be intact, and if so, you'll go back, fetch the ground truth data from the tablet controller, right? But in the data path itself, all you see is the router. The tablet controller is a potentially single point of failure. We have... <coughs> Uh, two or three of these running at any given time, but this comes into play only when data is partitioned, okay? Only when tablets are split or moved. I'll come back to that, which is a very, very rare event. For the most part, this system is very, very fault tolerant because routers can come and go. There's lots and lots of redundancy there, okay? Uh, and that's the basic uh, point of this design. We will have a layer of routers as opposed to just a hash function because, among other things, we wanted flexibility. This also allows us to have sorted records uh, with routers taking care of the ranges. So what you saw there is replicated in every color, and across colors, you have the messaging uh, pops up system that links them. Okay. Conceptually, your data consists of a table. A table is broken down into a collection of tablets, and tablets, one or more tables are interleaved on any given server. 
tablets from a given table could be spread across multiple servers. Okay? That's basically the story. There are kinds of tablets. Those where the data, the records, are organized by hashing on the key, which is what you see here. The second kind where the records are sorted by key. When I say sorted, what I mean is in any given tablet, you will see all records within a contiguous range. So if there is a record that logically fits in this range, right, but is not physically present, you can assume it's not there in the table. You don't do scatter gather. All right. Uh, however, the tablets are stored in contiguous order. They are deliberately distributed across servers for load balancing, okay, to get more parallels. The flexible schema part, this is what a table might look like initially. Over time, a new value is defined for a brand new field of one of the records. Over time, some other values are defined for other fields. Eventually, what you see is a highly sparse record. Okay. Any questions so far? That's a data model. That's a basic architecture. Now I'm going to dig a little deeper into the intro part. But the basics, hopefully, are clear. OK. So let's look at processing reads and writes. Uh, updates, a request comes to the router. It's direct to the, sto directed to the storage unit that contains the record. right? And what you do here is essentially the R equivalent of a write ahead log protocol. The change is first written to a message broker, a message broker node. In turn, it's written to a second node. So you have two levels of failure before you lose the change. And on then is the actual write recorded in the storage unit, and you return to the user. OK? We don't have a separate write ahead log. This serves as our write ahead log. And the messaging system guarantees in order delivery. And once the records are the change notifications are delivered to all callers that have a copy of this record, uh, this can be reclaimed. And we rely upon having a sufficient number of copies beyond that. Okay? Reads are pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, as you can, can expect, you go to the right storage unit and come back. Occasionally, you go to the storage unit and it says, I don't have that record, in which case it may be that the router information is valid. You go to the tablet controller, refresh the router information, possibly go someplace else. But that's exceedingly rare. OK. Range queries, well, if you take the data here and imagine that these are the tablet boundaries, right? Within each tablet, you have continuous yes, values. These are sprayed across the storage units, not necessarily in contiguous order. Okay. And you actually need to search. The router has the appropriate range information. Think of it as a one level B tree. The fan outs suffice to have one level. Uh, you would find the appropriate storage units that could possibly have records in the range you're looking for. You don't look at other storage units, right? And that's basically the story. Now, the basic operations supported by the system are exceedingly simple range queries and key-based uh, key probes okay, and updates. That's it. So what's the complexity here? It's not that you don't want to have SQL, uh, other kinds of more fancy retrieval, uh, materialist views, views, and the like. Right? It's more that we want to make sure that the basic functionality is supported with extremely high degrees of availability, elasticity, <coughs> and so on. Uh, eventually, we will increase the functionality. We already know how to do a broad class of materialized views and indexes, for example. But we'll probably never go all the way to full SQL. Okay? But also, also and there's a point you need to keep in mind. In terms of our consistency semantics, this, is, this system is not designed to go all the way up to ACID transactions. So those are the things I'll get into next. So if you look at elasticity, the underlying data, right? is initially partitioned across these four servers. Over time, right. data could be moved based upon the load by the system. Over time, as further data is added, tablets may grow. And if so, they're automatically split. By doing so, a server may become a hotspot. And if so, tablets are moved. Okay? 
the split and the movement of tablets are the only operations that actually affect the tablet controller. Pretty infrequent operations. Okay? Inserts of records, modifications of records, reads, write, don't touch the tablet controllers. Consistency. So Alice is on the west coast. And she updates her profile. It's updated in the copy closest to her. And then replicated asynchronously to copies of her profile elsewhere in other colors. Now let's say Bob comes, comes along and wants to see Alice's profile. He typically read a copy that's local. And when the big one hits, all is not lost. We are tolerant. Guys, fault tolerant. OK. This is a tough crowd. Acid consistency. OK. So what does acid mean? Let's say you maintain lists of friends. Brian has some friends. Toby has some friends. And you want to now declare that Brian is Toby's, friends, Toby's friend. And friendships are bidirectional. What you basically want is to see this new state. Okay? Toby added to Brian's list, and Brian added to Toby's list. However, you never want to see these inconsistent states, where this is added, but this is missing, or vice versa. Right? So there are these two records. And the changes have to be made together or not at all, atomically. That's hard to do. The, in general, there's this claim which actually was formalized in Google, Nancy Lynch, uh, and others that in a large scale distributed system, if you care about consistency, and I'll loosely define this as serializability for our purposes, uh, availability of the system through various kinds of failures. And partition tolerance, in particular availability in the presence of some link going down between the nodes. You have to give up at least one of these three. Okay? The reality of this is addressed by practical systems in many ways. right? And the approach that we take is best characterized as a particular form of restricting transactions. In effect, what we do is limit you to transactions on a single object. Transactions cannot span objects. However, the most useful aspect of what we do is not even transactional. You can make single object transactions, but in the most common use cases, all people do is take advantage of a timeline abstraction, which I'll explain in a moment. So consider this example. Alice is working on the West Coast, and her messenger status says she's busy. Then there is a network disruption. As it so happens, the disruption occurs before Alice's busy status is propagated to the East Coast. Okay? At this point, though, Alice is seamlessly connected to the East Coast because there's a problem here on the West Coast. She continues to work and declares herself to be free eventually. Now, question is reestablished. Consider what happens. From this side, the system tells the East Coast, Alice is busy, because it has not yet notified that yet. From this end, the system tells the West Coast, Alice is free. What do you do? You can't differentiate between them in a system that supports, say, eventual consistency. The guarantee of eventual consistency in systems like Dynamo from Amazon uh, is that both will eventually declare Alice to be busy, or both will declare her to be free, but no guarantee which. In reality, this is what happened. And if you decide that Alice is busy, the poor thing is going to be ostracized, and she's not going to be happy. Okay. So these are the kinds of applications we want to support. Okay. So what we effectively do can be described pretty simply. It's a primary copy protocol at the granularity of a single record. Right. So a single record is created here. There's some change, its version changes from V1 to V2. Another change, it goes to V3 and so on, all the way down to when it's deleted. Right? Every copy of this record, no matter where it is, will follow the same timeline. At any given point, there's a single logical master copy of the record. And other copies may lag the master in terms of where they are in the timeline. But eventually, they'll come. The tricky part of the story is 
we have to deal with failures. And you can't do it by saying, wait until the master comes back up. That's not an option. Okay? So, in general, reads are served using the local copy. They may be out of date. Most applications can't tolerate this. Right? Uh, however, you can also provide richer semantics. A read can say, I want to see the current version. And you can do this by automatically routing it to the master. But often, you don't need this. A read may simply say, read forward. If I saw a certain version of this, only show me later versions. Don't show me something older. You can do that too. Right? Uh, and on the slide where I showed updates, a timestamp was returned. That's what is used. OK. Uh, all this can be done. We can simulate test and set optic concurrency control and therefore single transactions. Uh, the summary here. Per record mastering is used to provide timeline semantics. There's a subtlety. Tablet mastering is required to avoid the creation of two records with the same key. So if you want to enforce primary key consistency, right, you need tablet mastering. Intuitively, I have a couple of slides which I'm going to skip over, so I'll mention this. Intuitively, upon an insert, you need to go to the master of the tablet to which the record belongs and apply it there and make sure there are no duplicates. There are some subtleties there. Uh, but if you want to, if you're willing to relax primary key consistency, you can make do strictly with per record uh, mastery. And if you want to relax even that and say, nah, I can't even accept the few scenarios where per record mastering uh, delays me, you can even relax that and go to eventual consistency. So it's a system that puts these many different levels of consistency. And the execution details are hidden from the user. You think of it purely in terms of the level of consistency you demand. Okay. And you do this on a per table basis. All the records in that table are governed by the choice you make, the choice you declare. So if you look at record masters, let's see what happens. So Alice makes a change to her profile. That's record B over there. Okay. Uh, when she makes the change, it is replicated to the East Coast. Let's say she moves to the East Coast. The first time she makes a change, you look, the, the change is directed here, but you know that the master is over there, so you redirect. Her change is actually applied here, therefore it takes a little longer, eventually repropagated. After this happens a few times, the system detects this and transfers the ship from there to here. Okay? And there are protocols to do so. Those same protocols kick in if the site that contains the master for it fails or that disk is not available. Okay? If there's failure, mastership is again transparently, uh, transparently transferred. The operation continues. If it's recovered, mastership may or may not go back to the original place depending on the current usage. Okay? That's how you get uh, both load balancing and fault tolerance. Uh, let me skip over the notion of tablet master. Availability. There are various failure modes. If a disk fails, what I told you, uh, transferring the XN, you typically don't have any availability impact. Okay? Uh, let me skip over this. In the, uh, how much time do I have? I should wrap up, right? Yeah, in the next, yeah, we'll do some time for questions maybe in the next five minutes. Great. So let me skip over this. If a router fails, this is trivial. If the tablet controller fails, this is why we have two or three copies of the tablet controller, and that suffices because it's an infrequently used component. If a message broker hub fails, again, this is easy to recover, although trust me on this one, I haven't told you enough yet. Uh, the subtle parts there are you have to flush certain things, uh, certain changes, and make sure they're applied you can replace uh, the hub. In this scenario, typically, you may have to you know, switch over to consistency, like eventual consistency, and consistency in this setting. OK, the last thing I want to say is that there's not just peanuts, but several other systems around. There's a hot, fertile area. Uh, you know, Cassandra, HBase, these are examples of systems people are building uh, to serve in this massively distributed manner. So it's <coughs> like all scenarios where lots of systems are being developed as we go, comparing them rigorously is useful and hard. 
So we accounted the benchmark to do this. Uh, and we also included a comparison of four candidate systems. Sharded MySQL, uh, which is basically similar to Sherpa, except there's no automatic transfer of uh, mastership or anything like that. The partitioning is static, so there's no elasticity. It's a basic. Uh, functionally, Sherpa gives you the key value capabilities of MySQL plus some other nice things like elasticity and tolerance. Cassandra is big table uh, with a dynamo-like uh, scheme for outing. HBase is big table with a like scheme for outing. And the thing about Cassandra and HBase, both of them are layered on top of Hadoop, which means the underlying store is essentially sequential, which means the way they mask random reads and writes is through differential files. Okay. Uh, Abstracting again in the interest of time, when they make a performance, it never goes to disk, right? Unless you want to write one local copy stably, uh, in exchange for possibly multiple reads from disk on reads. Okay, that's the basic trade off. If you look at these, I'm going to skip these detailed slides to leave you with a little bit of time. Here are some numbers. The numbers I will summarize for you. As expected, differential file systems are better on writes, not so good on reads. HBase is super good on writes because it doesn't even write to disk. It writes to a main memory copy and says all is good and moves on. Okay. Uh, on okay, this is just a read heavy update. Uh, you can see slight shift in trade-offs, but let me move on. Rain scans, you can make whichever you want look good. Uh, if you consider so very small range scans which begin to look like random reads, Sherpa is better. If you look at larger ranges, they behave like sequential access, which means the uh, the systems that lay the data out sequentially, HBase and Cassandra, do better. Scale up. These systems are all supposed to scale up, and they do to very degree. The fact that HBase is worse, it's not really a fundamental design issue. I think it's plain and simple, a sign of the maturity of the system. Okay. Uh, elasticity. Do these actually deliver on the promise that as you add more machines, they redistribute the load? Uh, well, Sherpa does more or less. Right. There's a period of time when you add an extra server when things are, the latency actually goes up because additional work is going on in terms of redistribution. But eventually when it settles, the average latency is lower than it used to be before, which is what you expect. And this happens in the order of minutes or tens of minutes, depending on the scale. Uh, Cassandra does the same. Uh, it's a little less effective in what it does, but again, reasonable. HBase has issues. Okay. Again, a matter of the current maturity of the system. Let me make that point again. If you take Cassandra, just in the course of benchmarking, these are the read-write curves of an older version of a newer version. Developers of these systems, when we sent them the results, said, what version are you using? 0.19? What do you mean by that? 0 0.20 came out on Monday. So these are systems that are changing rapidly with substantive changes. So what we are trying to put out there is not really a benchmark. The numbers are not that interesting. What we have there is a uniform framework that allows you to your, your own cloud system, uh, define your own workload. You don't have to agree with our workload. You can define a workload in a uniform manner and publish your results. In a way, the, you know, the details of a comparison that invalidate many comparisons. Okay? If you're interested in this, those in the open source uh, world out there, uh, you can contact either me and Cooper, and you can look at it if you're interested in the papers underlying this. Uh, there's a paper that talks about dealing with SKU uh, in a sorted uh, table, a basic overview, asynchronous view and index maintain, uh, maintenance, uh, uh, shorter summary, parallelizing range queries, and there are a few more uh, out there, so you can figure out exactly what we're doing. If you have questions, we're happy to answer. With that, let me stop and give you a chance to ask questions. Yes? So, with respect to the applications where you're trying yes. to do better prediction and engage the user more, there's a number of different inputs that you could change. So yes. you could invest in crawling Broader, getting the deep web, getting real-time Twitter, getting more data, as it were. 
you could invest in more storage and more computation so you could process in a deeper way for a given period of time on the data you do have. Or you could invest in saying, I'm going to leave those two things alone. I have a certain amount of processing, a certain amount of data, and I'm going to do better algorithms. Do you have a sense for classic applications where the best return on investment is? By and large, more data trumps anything else. So crawling deeper and wider. So crawling deeper and wider. Right. Uh, for most problems, the secret sauce seems to be data redundancy. Let me give you an example. I talked about data extraction earlier. Right. Conceptually, you can think of it this way. There is a true table out there of all celebrities, which you don't know. But many sites manifest their own stylized projections of the celebrities. Okay. And what we are really talking about is, from each side, reverse engineering an approximation of the, that projection, then unifying these tables to automate the actual original thing. Contrast this with the classic problem of data integration, which is a well-known black hole. Right? The data integration problem assumes you are given this, and all you are doing is trying to reconcile them. If that is so hard, why should this much harder problem seem seemingly be tractable? Uh, the secret is, in contrast to an enterprise scenario where there's really no redundancy, it's very carefully partitioned, the data is, right? There's tons and tons of redundancy here. The exact same inf information is manifested in myriad sites, and that redundancy helps you decipher what it really is about, right? And if you, 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 that's one instance, but there's actually a paper by Alan Halevi and a bunch of others uh, that talks about this, and I think it makes the case persuasively. Other questions? The reason you do not support model of SQL, is it because the application do not need at this point model of SQL, or is it because you have your attempt to support model, you would have to uh, areas that are not sufficiently well optimized and do not make the case for the reliability and performance and so on? So I think the answer is, to be more honest, in the context of peanuts, let me answer very specifically. Uh, it was a, a system built for primarily serving purposes. Most applications don't need very fancy SQL. In, in any event, if you supported it, if you ran fancy queries simultaneously with the transaction processing load, you'd be toast, right? Uh, but the truth also is, we just had our hands full getting SIG functionality in place. And the, the thing that most people demanded was a reliable store with all the properties I described. Things like availability and elasticity and fault tolerance were a lot more important than fancy SQL, which they were willing to work around initially. Over time, we'll make that a little bit more capable. But like I said, we have already designed an asynchronous view maintenance mechanism for a broad class of views. Uh, it's from, from getting it out there. So in contrast to the various NoSQL systems out there, I'm not of the opinion that you don't need functionality beyond key value stores, right? But I do agree that you don't need the kitchen sink, right? You can afford to truly give up quite a bit. Charles. So you have sophisticated algorithms for reliability, elasticity, availability, and so on. Yes. But if you look at the even bigger picture, it's often the unanticipated cause of failure that caused the major failure. So if you had a bug in an algorithm or if you had a bug in your software, then that could bring everything down and that's the line risk, the reputation risk to Yahoo. So how do you uh, try to cope with that issue? Unanticipated ways to have a colo blowout, a partition happen, a disk fail, I understand. But what are the unanticipated types of failure beyond this level of the system you're thinking about? But I'm asking at the higher level. Supposing that there's a bug in your algorithm or a bug in your code, right. almost by definition, that bug is replicated and could manifest itself in a total failure. The, the, the highest probability of a total failure comes from something you haven't anticipated rather than something you have anticipated. Yeah, so let me answer this slightly flippantly, but honestly enough. At this layer, the set of failure scenarios I listed is more or less comprehensive. What thing could be unanticipated reasons for one of these failures to occur? Okay, At higher levels of code, for example, the various pipelines and the modeling that I described, 
failure of the kind you're talking about could occur, right? And this might result, for example, in a very offensive username not being recognized as an offensive username, okay? And, and mail being sent to Carol saying, look, Carol, they're a fool. And she gets very upset with all of us, uh, which actually has happened. Uh, that's the problem of all these silly machine learning people. Jokes apart, I don't have a good answer for this, so I'm just punting on it. So let, me, let me follow a little. So you have a graph, a picture where you showed how you added a server, yeah. and there was a period yeah. of higher latency while it was adapting, and yes. then settled down to yes. better latency. Yes. What if there was a like your algorithm for adapting and the period of higher latency continued indefinitely or even grew exponentially? Th these are great points, and in fact, uh, these are not academic points. This actually happened in Amazon, yeah. right? Uh, it's never happened to us, no. Uh, the short answer is no, we have not even attempted to formally verify our systems to show that such things wouldn't happen. And if we were to, there's then the question of who verifies it, the assumptions under which your verification ran or comprehensive. The world is built on turtles, and we haven't even gone into the first of the turtles. Yeah, I think the answer is the yeah. state of programming is so bad right now yeah. that we can't even get the common case right. Yep. Yeah. Like the yeah. uncommon case. Yeah. But, yeah. but you're right. Uh, I mean, the, uh, there's Byzantine fault tolerances and yeah. programming. Lots of academic work has been done to address the problems that you bring up, but it's been yeah. basically academic. And we're not there yet with practical systems. If something like this happens, it's because during some of our tablet controller operations, we use Paxos. Okay. Which came from these distributed systems guys, so it's all their fault. Other questions? So, jokes apart, if it all works, we're happy to take credit. If it doesn't, we'll blame one of you. Thank you guys. Thank you.